How could knights contend with and combat against magic users in a fantasy world? This is partially a response to Shadowversity. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Guide Tour. And now this is partially a um, response to Shadowverse's excellent recent video looking at the role of knights in a world where magic exists. And um, I've just finished watching this video and it's really, really cool, but it raises in it a couple of interesting points that I think I can contribute to, um, and particularly where Shad addresses the issue of guns in a world where swords are used. So I think actually Shad's video is an excellent springboard for us to talk about number one, swords in a world where guns did exist and how did those two interact and additionally what can that tell us about how knights might exist in a world where magic exists. But before we get into the meat of this video I want to have a quick word from our sponsors who are Raid Shadow Legends. Raid is the wildly popular and hugely famous turn-based fantasy combat game. It's raining outside you've got nothing to do, you're waiting for the tournament to start or you're stuck on the train going to work, what do you do? Play Raid Shadow Legends, of course. And every good game has some really tough challenges waiting at the end of it, something you can really get your teeth into. And for Raid Shadow Legends, that is the Doom Tower. The Doom Tower is essentially a giant prison. The Arbiter fought a pack of really nasty bad guys a long time ago, but she wasn't strong enough to take them out for good. So instead, she locked them up in a massive super tower until she figured out how to deal with them. Well, it's been a few thousand years or something like that, and there's still a Doom Tower, so I guess we all know how that went. What's worse, now that Syroth is leaking back into the world, the Arbiter doesn't have the power to keep the wards up, so the Doom Tower's failing, and it's up to us to go in there and knock some heads together before they get out. To climb to the top, you're going to need an army of champions, the regular Doom Tower floors tend to be pretty easy to deal with if you've got a strong team, but the bosses are really tough and you need some serious specialists if you're going to be able to beat them. You want ways to remove debuffs and you'll also want pretty high resistance. Lots of Doom Tower bosses ignore block debuffs and they can do really nasty stuff to your champions like draining their turn meter or stripping their buffs. A couple of bosses need specific mechanics just to beat them, like the Scarab King. He takes barely any damage unless you reduce his maximum hit points and if you attack him without a shield buff on, he'll wreck your whole team really fast. I could go on for ages talking about how to beat these bosses, but the real fun starts when you go in and give it a try yourself. What I love most about Raid myself is going to the dungeons and trying to get better times and fighting other players in the arena. Other players and other teams are constantly getting stronger so the challenge keeps getting harder. And this month Raid has got a whole bunch of special events and activities to get involved with and towards the end of the month some special Halloween ones. We're talking some massive rewards here, special tournaments and some special fragment events so you can get shards for legendary champions including a one-off Halloween special. Raid's now bigger, busier and better than ever before and there's some huge new updates on the way soon as well so there's never been a better time to get started. If you want to get a huge head start in Raid all you have to do is hit the link in the description below or scan my QR code on screen and you'll get an epic hero called Chonoru who's amazing in the Doom Tower. 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill and 1 ancient shard so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get into the game. All this treasure will be waiting for you up here in the inbox and remember this is an offer that's only available for new players and only for the next 30 days. If you're quick enough then you can find me in game under the name Captain Context and you can join my clan. And it's that easy, go and give it a try now, scan the QR code or the link in the description below and I'll see you in game. So thanks for sticking with me, now let's get back to the main content of this video which is quite simply uh, a springboard of Shad's video where he looks at the role of knights in a world where spell users or magic users exist. Okay, so um, from the outset, I'll say that the reason that I decided to make a video about this is Shad makes some comments about how swords disappeared when firearms were invented, um, which I think are not accurately uh, representing the truth, which isn't a huge problem in itself. That's where I can step in and clarify a few things. But additionally, actually examining the truth, how did swords function in a world where gunpowder weapons exist actually can give us, so studying the history, can give us a really good inspiration and uh, basis, foundation, for looking at how might knights and other users of swords and hand weapons and this kind of stuff, armour, exist in a world where there are magic users. So first off, when did gunpowder weapons come about uh, into the world of arms and armour and warfare? Well, quite simply, the 14th century, okay? Certainly in Europe, uh, and I'll limit most of the discussion here to Europe, Obviously, we can go further back if we go out to China, for example. Uh, but in terms of European warfare, and it has to be said whilst the Chinese had gunpowder earlier, 
it was really the Europeans who seem to have made some of the earliest use of it for weaponry, um, and the Ottomans, it must be said as well. So really we're talking about the, the first uh, appearance on the battlefield of guns, if we call them that, for the most part in the early part, uh, large guns, so cannons, what people commonly call them as, although they went under various different names at the time. And then very soon after, handheld firearms, which at the beginning were pretty much like mini handheld cannons. Okay, so a tube that you put gunpowder in, wadding, you put a shot, a ball, whatever down, and you shoot it out. So the, one of the first occurrences of, of the a cannon actually being used that we know about was during the Cressy campaign in 1346. So we're talking about around the time of the Black Death. Okay, um, so in the middle of the 14th century, the middle of the 1300s. Um, that's really, really quite early. Now, clearly, that's a long time ago. Um, Gunpowder gun weapons continued to be used for the rest of the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, and of course, the 1900s. And really, it takes us up to World War One. Now, I'm going to finish my uh, kind of historical uh, period at World War One and a little bit World War Two. Okay, we're going to talk about hand weapons and firearm weapons. But Quite clearly, when firearms appeared on the battlefield in the 14th century, the 15th century, in the 16th century, there were still knights, there was still armour, there were still swords like this long sword and various other types of sword. So clearly, hand weapons still had an important role to play for hundreds of years after gunpowder came in. Now, some of you might say, OK, Matt, that's fair. But in the 14th century, there weren't many guns around. That's true. In the 15th century, there were, however, an increasing number of guns around. And really, we start to see guns playing a, a very important role on the battlefield in the Hundred Years' War towards the, the last couple of decades of it. So really, by the 1440s and 1450s, especially the 1450s, the last few battles of the Hundred Years' War, the French really got on top of the use of firearms. Now, this isn't only cannons. And it's not only one type of, you know, large cannon. Obviously, the uh, Constantinople was, um, now Istanbul, was conquered by the Ottomans using very, very, very large cannons for the period, uh, which you can see um, original, the actual examples of, for example, down in Portsmouth at the Royal Armouries. But, um, so clearly large guns were used in siege warfare. They were also used in battles and there were smaller types of early field artillery. So the early forms of wheeled and uh, transportable, easily transportable and deployable guns, large guns, crewed by a small group of people, were being used by the 1450s. And um, importantly, also handheld guns. There were numerous types of handheld guns around by the middle of the 15th century. And we clearly know that uh, people wearing armour, fully armoured knights, heavy cavalry in armour, continued to be a thing up until the 17th century, okay? So we're talking about from uh, 14, um, 1450 through to 1650, armour was still a thing for certain types of troops, okay? Why was that? Uh, and I'll get on to magic. If you're, if you're going, Matt, I'm here for the wizards, I'm here for the sorcerers, I will get to that. Um, because we have to lay this foundation of history and what we know from a technology coming in, a magical type technology uh, that's more powerful than the things that have gone before, um, as a foundation for that. And quite simply, um, I've spoken about this in depth when I've been looking at the 19th century. So if we leap forward to the 19th century, um, we find that swords and bayonets and cutlasses and various other types of hand weapon were still in use extensively in the 19th century. Um, and just to set a bit of context, this revolver is from the 1860s. This is a breech loading five shot revolver. So you've got five shots there. You can put your metallic cartridges in the back and bang, 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 you can go, but you still need a sword. Why? Well, not everybody carried swords, admittedly, and there were people at this time who started to question the need for these. But bear in mind, we're really talking, before people started talking about the need for any type of hand weapons, we're talking about really the... 1850s at the earliest, really the 1860s, 70s, 1880s. And even in the 1880s, people were still using swords. If you look at the Sudan campaign, if you look at India, Northwest Frontier, China, people were still using swords and bayonets. And I will go a little bit later uh, in period in a minute. 
So quite simply, in the age of gunpowder, even when you've got multi-shot um, handguns and uh, the beginning of breech loading um, rifles, for example, these hand weapons, so the shock of cavalry um, and um, you know boarding actions on ships, going into buildings, trench warfare, this kind of stuff, hand weapons still have a role. Why? Well, quite simply, even though you've got a multi-shot gun here, it's not that easy to reload. Um, so you don't have dropout magazines like a modern um, firearm, and it's not easy to put another five rounds into this once you've expended these, especially if you're in close combat, if you're actually in the heat of the moment and things are going down. Um, so you've got your five shots with this. Now, don't assume that that five shots equals five dead enemies, because it certainly doesn't. Number one, a shot has to hit someone to actually have any effect on them whatsoever. And even if you hit them, that one shot doesn't mean that they're going down. So we have all sorts of records of people missing with their guns. And we have all sorts of records of people then hitting people with their bullets and the bullets not having the desired effect and that opponent still coming onto them. So, for example, in Afghanistan, Northwest Frontier, Sudan, we've got many records of people putting repeated bullets into a charging enemy and they still come in. And at that point, they have to parry with their sword and it turns into a close combat fight as well. This happened with bayonets. Um, this happened with... Um, um, needing to use a bayonet after having shot someone with a rifle as well, incidentally. And so, absolutely, these weren't magic wands. And maybe magic shouldn't be either. We'll talk about that in a second. So, even in an age when we had relatively developed firearms, and obviously not, not up to the standards of what we've got uh, available today, um, particularly when it comes to reloading, and I think that's one of the key facts here, the ability to quickly reload a firearm that we have now, they didn't really have then. Now, one example where you have a lot of shots for this period is, this is my favorite rifle to shoot. This is a uh, rifle that I shoot on the range at Bisley, and this is an 1866, it's not an original, it's a replica by Uber Uberti, um, but it's an 1866 lever action Winchester. Now, this contains um, a number of rounds, it depends what caliber ammunition you use, I think mine takes uh, 13 or 14 rounds, and I only have a load 10 in it. Um, but you have a number of shots quickly at, um, at access to, um, to reload and fire um, over and over and over again very, very quickly. However, even when this is empty, it's not very quick to reload. You have to push the rounds in the back here, and it's not something you can do unless you're disengaged from close combat. So if you're in close combat, You've got your 13 rounds or whatever, and then you've got a heavy piece of iron and wood and a bit of brass, okay? So this, even this, um, was an absolute game changer in its period in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, and later forms of Winchester repeater that came along. However, it wasn't so much of a game changer that it instantly made hand weapons or cavalry with lances or what you know people with bayonets. It didn't make them obsolete. Okay, now zooming forward, another firearm that I uh, love to shoot is my original World War I, 1916, I think it's dated. Can't see the date now. There we go, 1916. Um, SMLE, Lee Enfield rifle, with a bayonet fitted. Hmm, why is that there? Well, famously, you know that bayonets were used. Uh, they weren't necessarily caused a huge number of deaths compared to shelling and, and artillery fire and all of these other sorts of things statistically. But nevertheless, they were used in World War I. But this isn't a World War I bayonet, folks. This is actually a World War II bayonet because, yes, bayonets were still being used in World War II. So even in the age of aircraft and uh, bombers and, uh, you know, very long-range artillery and tanks and all of these things, flamethrowers and everything else we've got available, People were still using a rifle with a bayonet on the end. They were still using fighting knives. They were still using bayonets. So close combat was still a thing. And obviously, famously, the Japanese with their uh, Banzai charges made great use of it uh, in, in the jungles of Burma and elsewhere. Um, and in fact, this rifle, although it was originally built for World War I, was reissued in World War II, given a new barrel. And this is a World War II Indian Army bayonet on it. So hand weapons were still a thing even in World War II. So, absolutely, for numerous reasons, close combat with hand weapons has continued to be a thing, and that involves close combat hand weapons, sharp weapons, for example, bludgeoning weapons, things like this, and sometimes 
armour against those things have continued to be a thing from the middle of the 14th century all the way 600 years all the way up to well 700 years nearly all the way up to today okay so quite clearly that magical technology that came along firearms and guns didn't make hand weapons and people that use hand weapons obsolete so how can we relate this to sorcery and magic users? Well, quite simply, we have to look at the level of magic, okay? So when you're creating your environment, whether it's for a, a novel or whether it's for a role-playing game or whatever, um, or even a video game, then you have to decide what are the parameters of that magic. Is it god-level magic where you can go like this and, and turn back time or whatever? Or is it fairly low-level stuff whereby you can, uh, you know, use the force, for example, like force push someone or, or pull something towards you or make something break off the wall and drop? Um, or is it somewhere in between those two things where you can shoot lightning bolts or fireballs or whatever? And whatever those things are, this as I view it, is a form of manipulation of energy, okay? And when we use energy, at some point, whether it's bullets in a gun, or whether it's actual physical energy, where you eat food and your body gets energy and you use it and you burn calories, um, you're gonna run out of it, okay? So, I would suggest that if you're creating an environment where there are magic users, the magic shouldn't have infinite energy. It should drain, it should run out. That makes it like guns, okay? The simple fact is whether it's the 19th century with a uh, 1860s revolver or whether it's uh, World War I <laughs> with, uh, with a bolt action rifle with its 10 rounds or whether it's uh, fireballs, that thing should run out at some point. Now, as so, as, so long as that energy source and that offensiveness, that weapon has a, uh, an expendable resource, then hand weapons are still going to have a tremendous amount of use because the simple fact is that these don't run out, okay? Additionally, think about the analogy with firearms missing or not having the desired effect on the target. The simple fact is if you are able to cast uh, some sort of magic missiles, fireballs, lightning, whatever, that doesn't have to be a fight ender. That could be something that, much like throwing darts at someone, wounds the target but doesn't completely stop them. It maybe saps some of their energy. Um, it might hit or it might miss. So you could be shooting your magic missiles, but are they have they got a homing like like uh, like a sidewinder missile or something? Do they are they heat seeking? But if you're just if you're just throwing them like you'd throw a projectile, well then presumably you can miss with it. Additionally, even if you hit the target, you might hit, need to hit the target several times to stop them. And if you don't do it quick enough. Um, or you don't see the target approaching you because they're approaching you from over here and at the moment you see them you only manage to get a couple of shots off at them and then they're going to be in there with their hand weapon be it a sword or a knife or whatever now when we come to armor you have to say well in an environment where swords or bayonets or spears or whatever are still very useful then armor is going to be a useful thing as well and I know that, uh, for example, in D&D, they've made lots of reasons why magic users can't wear certain types of armor. Um, and that is basically so they're not too powerful. <laughs> because if you put full plate harness on, you're actually quite impervious to lots of type of simple weapon attacks. And it would basically make the magic users too powerful. Um, so you could keep that kind of rule. Um, but you have to say, actually, okay, so if, if the force is a thing, if we go to a Star Wars environment, if the force is a thing and you can force push and you can um, strangle someone and all that kind of stuff, but you can still wear armor, mm, yeah, that's, that's kind of creating a balance as well. So if you make the magic slightly less powerful than a sort of uh, Forgotten Realms D&D type magic or Lord of the Rings type magic, if you make the magic less powerful, then maybe you can make certain other things more fair to balance it out and allow your magic users to wear armor and use swords at the same time. That's the other thing I wanted to say. So if we go back to the 19th century for inspiration, it was completely common for cavalrymen and officers and sometimes sailors to have a sword or cutlass in one hand and a gun in the other hand. 
why not? Why not have both? Um, so, you know, certainly if we go to Lord of the Rings, we see Gandalf fighting with a sword and using magic, or fighting with a staff and using magic, or a staff and a sword in some cases. Um, so why not? Um, so a fighter mage, for example, um, absolutely. Why not be casting spells um, or shooting fireballs or whatever you want to do with one hand and, and defending uh, with the sword with the other hand? Seems like a really fun combo to have. And again, if we're making a parallel between magic and firearms, then absolutely um, that's the sort of thing you could look at a historical period for inspiration and bring that in. And I think lots of uh, fantasy systems have done that. We also have a parallel again when we've got our magic device here, which is our firearm, but we have a bayonet for it. Um, so uh, we've got both. So going back to the original point, I think the fact is we have to, I just really, really want to emphasize and reiterate this. Firearms were in use between approximately 1350 and today, and hand weapons were still used hugely. I mean, knights were still around from 1350 until 1550, um, and you could say beyond that as well, um, and cuirassiers or armoured cavalry and, and pikemen wearing armour were still around up until 1650. Um, and yes, indeed, we do find the armour starts to disappear somewhat um, after 1650-ish. Certainly, definitely after 1700, it, it becomes pretty much regarded uh, as obsolete, with a few rare exceptions like French cuirassiers and Prussian cuirassiers. Um, but by and large, yes, armour does disappear after that. However, if we look at that period between 1350 and 1650, an age when firearms became increasingly common, and that's very different to a magic user, okay? Magic users are uncommon. You wouldn't have an army of magic users in most fantasy environments. You might have a few people in one army who are able to do magic, which is only akin to the 14th century context where you've got a few firearms on the battlefield. So if you've only got a few of these magical, all-powerful things, be it a cannon or a wizard, <laughs> that's right, cannon or wizard is the new trope. Uh, if you've only got one or two cannons or one or two wizards in your army, then it really doesn't make any difference to the rest of the army because statistically they're not going to have enough of an effect on all of the knights, hundreds of knights that you need in a typical battle, you know, Battle of uh, Agincourt for example, uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of men at arms, the people who we would term knights, fully armoured men with horses and lances. Um, so it doesn't make a difference. So. I would say if you're talking about a medieval fantasy environment or even a renaissance fantasy environment, having a few magic users doesn't really make much difference to knights. They are still completely intrinsic and important to the makeup of an army. Just the same as guns didn't make knights or armoured people or hand weapons or things like swords disappear overnight when they appeared. It took hundreds of years of coexistence. I hope this has been thought-provoking and helpful for some of you. Um, check out Shad's video, I'll put the link below. Uh, it's a really, really cool, thought-provoking video. It inspired this video. Um, thanks for watching, and I hope I'll see you back on this channel again soon. Cheers, folks! Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like, and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks!